Right. Um, thank you very much, firstly, for, for um, inviting me to, to talk today. Um, so I just want to tell you uh, what I do with radio frequency um, and how it, how it impacts what I do at work. So, so as Gareth said, I'm a, a professor of radio frequency engineering. I work at the University of Manchester. And um, I, so I work in the Faculty of Engineering and Physical Sciences. Um, and it's a very big university, so I have a, a very um, diverse team. And it's, for me, that's a, that's a really great thing. Um, before I start, um, or to start really, RF is beautiful. I think RF engineering is very, very beautiful. And I think that's probably, that, that sentence was the thing that, that made Andrew invite me, because um, I said that on Twitter, that it was this picture um, from, from Australia, some people that I work with at the Australia National Telescope Facility. And they're, they're um, testing their new feed horn for the telescope. And I just said, wow, this, this is beautiful. And Andrew uh, retweeted it and said, yes, I agree, RF engineering is beautiful. And there are so many examples of, of how, how beautiful RF engineering is. And, um, and I think we, we still um, suffer from, a, from an image problem, in, certainly in the UK, um, what engineering is, what engineers look like, and what we do. And, uh, and I think this just shows how, how beautiful RF engineering could be. But obviously, it's more than that. Um, it's what engineering could do, not just how it looks. So I just want to take you through a few examples of, of what I think it could do in the future and, and how I'm using it in my research. Um, there is absolutely no doubt that wireless technology, radio frequency technology, is a, is a defining part um, of modern day life and a crucial part of a social infrastructure as well. Um, but it's, it's certainly very, very key in, in my research. So I use it to solve or help solve one of the engineering grand challenges. Have you heard of these, the 14 engineering grand challenges? No, there are 14 um, in the world uh, that, that we need to solve for the 21st century. And I work on one of these, so I engineer the tools for scientific discovery. I'm going to explain a little bit about what that means in a bit. But just a bit of background for me. I, um, so I, I went uh, to university because I was really interested in maths and physics and I really enjoyed studying maths and physics. And at the time, engineering wasn't really a thing um, for, for certainly girls to, to study. Civil engineering was a little bit, but, but certainly not electronic or electrical engineering. And, and so my career's advice was study astrophysics. So I studied astrophysics at university as an undergrad. But everything I did was very practical and um, you know, the, th the theoretical side is very important, but the practical side was, was really where my passion was. And eventually, the light bulb went on that that was actually engineering. And so my, my PhD and, and so forth was, was in engineering. And it made me think, well, what, what is it that defines an engineer? And there are so many big debates that you can see on, on the web about this. But to me, it's the why and the how. I think everyone is born as a scientist. I don't know any child who doesn't ask why. And for those people who have children, I have a nine-month-old and she's not talking yet, but I'm sure one of her first words will be why. Um, and so I think we're all born scientists. We all ask why, but we don't all ask how. And I think the why and the how, so why do things work, how do things work, to me, is engineering. And so, so that's um, sort of a defining part in, in my career now. And I take the why and the how to, to engineer tools for scientific discovery. So what I'd like to do is just give you a few examples of, of how I uh, use RF engineering, how I use uh, the radio frequency part of the electromagnetic spectrum to engineer the tools for scientific discovery. So the first one I'd like to talk about is um, the Big Bang, we've heard of Big Bang, yeah? Yeah, cool. Um, not the TV program, the actual, how it all started. Um, so this is a, a map of um, the Big Bang radiation. So, so this is looking at when the Big Bang, uh, approximately 14 billion years ago, um, happened. There was a, there was a temperature uh, radiation that was released. And in order to find out some very, very fundamental um, laws in astrophysics, cosmology, and 
fundamental physics, you have to understand this radiation and what it means. And it, it, um, it defines the Big Bang as a theory because the Big Bang is still a theory. We can't for sure prove it. And also where the universe is going in the future. So are we expanding? Are we collapsing, etc.? So, so this is a map of the universe, which sounds a really strange thing to say, but it's, that is a map of this temperature. So we're effectively looking back in time 14 billion years and mapping this temperature and using that to help us explain some very, very fundamental um, or answer some very, very fundamental and ambitious questions in, um, in cosmology and fundamental physics. So, so in order to, to answer these questions more clearly, we need to be able to map this um, in much more detail or a lot more detail. So, so I worked on a, um, a space probe called Planck, which some of you may have heard of. Uh, this was an unmanned spacecraft. And the, the actual instrument itself is this small gold thing here. Looks small compared to the rest of the, the spacecraft. So, so really, all of, all of the other stuff is all of the ancillary stuff that you need in order to launch um, a spacecraft or a, a, an instrument into space. So I worked on this, and it's to study this remnants of the Big Bang, which is called the Cosmic Microwave Background, or the CMB. And, uh, and I, worked on <laughs> I worked on the low-frequency instrument, and the low-frequency instrument started at 27 gigahertz, um, which it was always interesting to me, because the first amplifiers that I designed were um, for... So I worked at Jodrell Bank Observatory in Cheshire, and the very first... Uh, designs were at 327 megahertz. So then to go to um, 27 gigahertz and for someone to call it low frequency was an interesting concept for me. Um, but I, I worked on the amplifiers um, for 27 to, to 44 gigahertz. And um, it was a really a interesting experience. So, th so this is a, a big spacecraft mission, largely from the European Space Agency, ESA, but we worked with NASA as well. And... Um, so you, you have uh, these amplifiers. So I'm, I'm designing these amplifiers. You can imagine the signal that you're trying to, um, to pick up is so weak. You know, you're, you're effectively looking back at a radiation that happened 14 billion years ago. So the signal is very, very weak, the radio signal. Um, and so the amplifiers are very, very um, specialized. They're, um, they're not the type of thing you can just go down to Maplin and buy. And they're two millimeters square these things. So they're a, they're a full amplifier, but they're two millimeters square. And, um, and, and these things become like your baby for, for years and years because you're designing them and then you get them fabricated and then you get them built up into a, an amplifier, um, into a body. And then and everything is in a clean room. So, you know, these sort of rooms where you can literally just see people's eyes and everything else is just covered. Um, even sort of their, their shoes are covered and in uh, all clean room clothing and, and nobody can touch them because they're super sensitive to electrostatic. Uh, and then somebody says, okay, now we're gonna take that off you and, and shake them and put them in a G-force and then put them in space. And you're like that, no, I'm not, I'm really worried about these things. So, um, but thankfully uh, everything was okay and uh, it, did, it did get to the place it was meant to go to, which is a place called uh, Lagrange point two. So, or L2, and it's 1.5 million kilometers from the Earth, and it's a specific uh, place in the solar system that you can take measurements. Um, the, the actual radio radiation, the radio wave radiation, is very strong in that area of the solar system. So it went out there, it took, took measurements of um, the cosmic microwave background, the, the CMB, and um, it did produce the last last year I think it was or the year before um, it did produce the the most accurate map of the cosmic microwave background ever and it, for me it was a great project to work on a huge international project um, and to work in space and and trying to grab the radio waves from 14 billion years ago was such a, an interesting concept uh, to work on but for me it, it also meant that somebody had to have the imagination to build that spacecraft and say, right, we're going to look back in time 14 billion years with this spacecraft. And to me, that took a huge amount of imagination. I mean, these engineers have got a huge amount of imagination. Engineers are ingenious. And it made me think, um, what other 
huge ideas have come just by engineered in our imagination. So I want to read something out and see if you can guess what year this might be. It would be possible to call up and talk to any telephone subscriber on the globe. An inexpensive instrument, no bigger than a watch, will enable us to hear anywhere, on sea or land, speech or music, delivered in some other place, however distant. In the same manner, picture, characters, drawings or print can be transferred from one place to another. How long ago do you reckon that was? Because basically what they're talking about is the Apple Watch. That's coming out now. How many? Not bad, 115 years ago. Yeah, about 115 years ago. And it was Nikola Tesla who said it. Um, and I want to come back to him because I think he's a real unsung hero. So I want to come back to him in a second. But he, he was basically talking about wireless technology 115 years ago. And we're just getting what he, what he thought of. So he's talking about wireless communication. But I think we, we associate a lot of it with Michael Faraday. He demonstrated electromagnetic induction in 1831. And so I think we think of him as, as one of the grandfathers of, of uh, wireless communication. And then uh, along came um, James Clerk Maxwell. And then he developed um, his, they sort of laid the theoretical foundations and developed Maxwell's equations. Um, and that's something that is totally embedded in, in my work as, and many other people's work as Maxwell's equations. Then um, Heinrich Hertz came along and took James Clerk Maxwell's work, but then developed a more practical um, implementation of it. So he demonstrated that you could um, wirelessly transmit across a few meters. And then I think what, who we really um, relate to with wireless technology is Marconi. And I'm sure many of you know, he demonstrated the first transatlantic message, the first wireless message in 1901. Um, but Marconi built so much of his work on Tesla. And Tesla, to me, um, is, is such an unsung hero. He did so much. It's incredible how much he did. And if you go, um, if you Google him, there's, there's a great rant that you can get from somebody who was obviously a massive Tesla fan. How, and he just um, pinpoints or highlights everything that Tesla has done that other people have got credit for. So he's a real unsung hero. And I think this picture just sums him up for me, really. <laughs> to, you know, to to just sit in his, um, uh, in his lab in Colorado Springs um, as if it's just a very normal activity to have such huge amounts of electricity over your head. Um, it shows a certain sense of humor from the man, I think. Um, and he's, he's known a lot for um, alternating current, um, AC, as opposed to direct current, DC. And, um, but he's also uh, known for transmitting wirelessly uh, electrical energy or lighting up um, tubes, fl fluorescent tubes, um, uh, wirelessly. There's a great story actually with, um, with Tesla and Edison. So Edison was um, very much a DC person, a direct current person, and they were, they were developing AC and DC more or less the same time, and there's a big thing called the War of Currents. Has anyone heard of this? Yeah? So the Edison and Tesla were, were um, enemies and in this war of currents. And basically, Edison was telling everybody in the world how terrible AC is and how dangerous it is and how you definitely shouldn't back AC. You should definitely back DC because that's the way forward. It's safe. That's the future. And so, and what he did was um, uh, they found out that lots of animals, lots of pets were going missing around the area where Edison had his laboratory. And what Edison was doing was taking the animals and literally frying them with AC to show people how dangerous AC was. Um, so it was a real war between these two, um, two people. But obviously, as we know, we, we need both AC and DC. Um, we need the AC to, to travel uh, long distances and then DC once it gets into our home because it is um, much, much more safe. So, um, but yeah, Tesla is uh, a, real, um, a real unsung hero for me and he did do a lot on wireless uh, transmission and without that we wouldn't have things like the smartphone which as I said earlier is totally embedded in our modern day life. Do you know how many smartphones there are in the world now? Have a guess. There are more mobile phones than people 
in the world now. It's an incredible stat. 7.2 billion mobile phones. And that number will already be obsolete now that I've said it. Um, but yeah, 7.2 billion, more mobile phones than people. So there is, there is no doubt that wireless technology and, and mobile phones are, a, are an integral part of our, um, of our social and uh, uh, professional work. Um, many of you will, will know what an electromagnetic spectrum looks like, but I just wanted to sort of um, show that, that literally everything and everywhere we go and everything we do, we are bathing in a sea of electromagnetic waves. Um, you, you can't get away from these things. So, so radio and microwaves is, is where I do my work, um, which always is a funny thing when I meet new people or my friends have a good laugh about this, about how I can fix their microwaves. Clearly, I can't fix their microwaves. Um, but then you go all the way up to, to much higher, higher frequencies, much shorter wavelengths um, up at, at gamma rays as well. And this, this, like I say, this uh, electromagnetic spectrum, it's everything we do is totally embedded in this. Um, and it doesn't matter where you are in the world, you're bathing in these sea of, of EM waves. Um, but now we, we're trying to take um, wireless technology and RF technology to the next level. And what, what I and, and a, a number of people are trying to do is... Um, is try and change the world we live in, in in fundamental ways, but using RF technology. So it's really defining the way we farm, the way we fly, the way we design cities, um, and so much more. So I just want to give you a few examples of how, how I'm doing that. So for instance, there are um, 2.8 billion people in the world that are still affected by water scarcity. And that number is only going to increase as the need to feed a growing population also increases. And there are many people trying to use um, wireless subsoil technology to, to help um, monitor and measure soil, uh, soil parameters. So soil parameters such as the temperature, the moisture, and then nutritional ingredients that you need for, for crop growth. And so the, the project I work on tries to do this and it integrates passive RFID technology or radio frequency identification technology and um, subsoil sensing technology. So what we have here are some nodes, wireless nodes that are buried in the soil and they'll be doing the monitoring. And then an RFID reader would be on the tractor. And a really important part in, in our project is that these nodes don't contain any batteries because you don't want to contaminate that soil. So they're capable of harvesting energy from the electromagnetic spectrum um, generated by, by the RFID reader. So what happens is the, the nodes are in the soil and taking all of this data, then that data is transmitted wirelessly through the soil to um, the RFID reader on the tractor. And that allows the farmer to then determine what action to take based on the results that they're getting. And so when you combine that with um, a GPS um, system so that the farmer knows exactly where the tractor is in a field, then that will allow the farmer to determine in real time whether to irrigate that part of the field. So, so we're, we're trying to tackle the problem of world food and water shortages by shifting towards a, a model of precision agriculture using wireless technology for this. And that technology is the same technology that I used in the Planck project as well. It's fundamentally the same. It's so different in terms of its application, but it's fundamentally the same. Or consider jet engines. Um, aeroplanes are mission critical vehicles. We want them to be safe. We want them to be reliable, but we also want them to be efficient. We want them to be able to reduce the carbon emissions that we use in the world. So, um, so during uh, development engines such as uh, Rolls-Royce engines are instrumented with hundreds sometimes even thousands of sensors and um, these sensors currently are hardwired in the engine and because they're hardwired they're expensive they're very inflexible and it's really time-consuming to set up a network and um, and also they're, they're susceptible to cable and connector faults as well so we are proposing to use wireless sensor networks in the RF uh, region to, um, to try and tackle these problems of, of 
um, expensive, susceptible to cable and connector problems, etc. So, so imagine a, an engine and a wireless sensor network is set up inside an engine. And then imagine if it was really quick and easy to add another node to that engine. So you could have much more nodes than you could if you had a, a hardwired version. And so you get much more data about this engine. The more data you have, the more knowledge you can build up of that engine. And the more knowledge we have, the more likely we are to be able to design much more safe, reliable, and efficient engines. And the efficiency is the key thing here. So, so we're using wireless technology, um, and this is around the 2.4 gigahertz range, to, um, to design or help design much more efficient engines. So we're reducing the carbon emissions in large uh, Rolls-Royce engines. So they're Trent 900 and they're Trent 1000, they're, they're latest engines. Um, that's what we're using in the development stage of them. Um, another example is that of the built environment. So, so using wireless technology um, to map the inside of buildings for the visually impaired. So in the response to, to give uh, visually impaired people equal access to public buildings, Braille became um, a legal requirement in many countries, including the UK. So in the UK, as you know, we have uh, Braille signs affixed to many things in public buildings. Um, toilet signs, lift panels, top and bottoms of flights of stairs. But for a visually impaired person, there is an inherent challenge here, and that is to actually physically locate the signs in order to read the Braille through touch. And it's a, it's a real challenge for visually impaired people and, and it leaves them naturally frustrated with it. So, so we are using wireless technology um, in, a, in a region of 900 megahertz to, to 2.4 gigahertz to map the inside of buildings so that a visually impaired person can navigate through um, a public building. So, so this is my building in Manchester. Well, not mine, <laughs> I work in this building um, in Manchester. This is the University of Manchester. And, um, and we use this building as a pilot because if you could navigate through this building, I think you could probably navigate through any building. Um, so, so we use this as, as the pilot. So what we have are um, RFID um, tags, radio frequency identification tags, um, embedded into braille signs. Then a visually impaired user of this building would then be able to um, be given an RFID reader, which would be integrated into their smartphone, and that will be capable of wirelessly interrogating the tags in the braille signs. And so it would retrieve all the information needed to, um, for that visually impaired person to, to then navigate safely through the buildings. So we're using RF technology to um, help create smart navigational tools for the visually impaired as well. And again, this, it's RFID technology. It's not that different from what we're using on farming and what we're using in space as well. Um, the, the last um, uh, example I'd like to give is, is big scale instruments that use radio waves in the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, we've been able to, to broadcast radio waves into deep space and listen to radio signals from deep space for over a century now. And I think what's that, what that has allowed us to, to understand or realise is how little of the universe we, we think we know, or there is, that we think we know. There is so much beyond what we think we know. And so uh, larger and more powerful astronomical instruments have been built in the past decades to look deeper and deeper into space. And I'm very fortunate to, to be working on, on one of those uh, now. It's the, the largest and most powerful radio telescope ever. And it's called the Square Kilometre Array. Has anyone heard of this? The SKA? A few nods there. Oh, sorry, that's so dark. Um, this is the uh, Square Kilometre Array. It's a, this is an artist's impression of it because it's not built yet. Um, and so the, so the Square Kilometre Array will be... Um, uh, hundreds of thousands of radio antennas of different types um, and it will have a quite a wide frequency range working from about 70 megahertz. Um, they haven't quite decided where they want to end because the, the astronomers keep going, oh well if you just shift it higher and higher we can observe something else, but it's around 20 gigahertz. So we're going 70 megahertz to 20 gigahertz, um, hence you need um, a different variety of radio antennas for the job. 
So, but they'll all be connected. So these hundreds of thousands of, of antennas will all be connected and they're spread across thousands of kilometers. But they'll have a central core in Western Australia and one in a remote area of South Africa. And the, the sheer size of the SKA will make it 50 times more sensitive than any other radio instrument in the world. And um, in fact, it will be so sensitive that uh, it will be able to detect an airport radar on a planet 10 light years away. So it's really, really, really sensitive. And the amount of data it will produce is enormous. The, the dishes, just the dishes, if you can see the dishes here themselves, so forget all of the other um, low frequency um, dipoles and things, just the dishes themselves will produce 10 times the global internet traffic worth of data. And if all of the dipoles are built, they may produce 100 times the global internet traffic. So the amount of data it's going to produce is absolutely huge. I mean, these things are, you need a lot of data, you want to try and map the world, map the universe um, in, in unprecedented detail. But the amount of data that, that we'll be taking is, is quite astronomical, literally. Um, so, so they are three, four examples of, of how I'm using uh, radio frequency and wireless technology in, in my research at, at work. And hopefully that's shown you quite a diverse range. So, so we've got something in space, we've got something in the ground looking at space, but then I work with farmers and I work with people in aerospace as well. So it's very, very diverse what you can actually do or what I can do, um, my team can do with, with radio waves as well. Um, I'd like to um, give a, a call to action now, just before I end, um, for, for people. And I think this will work really well with the, um, the hack space that's got a great name, um, Bridge Rectifier. Yeah. Um, so Manchester is becoming the European City of Science next year. <coughs> and um, there is a big citizen science project, um, or what I'm now coining a citizen engineering project. To, and it's so, so my idea to do this is to construct the largest robotic orchestra and to put a sort of a sustainable element to it, try and use things that you might have at home that uh, you'd be throwing out or you want to repurpose. Um, so repurposing your old gadgets, try and make some, some actual robots from them. And there are so many things you can do with them. Um, unfortunately, I, I couldn't bring it today. I wanted to try and bring one that we've already done, but you can see it on, on the web. So we've got 16 floppy drives, because nobody uses floppy drives anymore. Um, and so we got 16 of them and just took the, the covers off them. And then where the actual motors move, you can, obviously you can hear the motors moving and you can tune them to play music. And so we've got um, uh, 16 of them and they play so many different things, but the Imperial March from Star Wars is a really good one. Um, Eye of the Tiger, classic 80s rock um, is, is a great one as well. Um, there, are, there are so many different uh, pieces of music. Game of Thrones is another one. I don't know Game of Thrones, but apparently it sounds like um, Game of Thrones. But it's, you're literally just moving the motors in the floppy drives themselves and it's creating music. Um, another one we've done is with a Tesla, small Tesla coil and um, by shifting the frequency in, in the Tesla coil that can play music as well. So there are so many different ways in which you can do this. So, so we, we are going to construct the largest robotic orchestra. Um, we need maker spaces, hacker spaces, um, school children, uh, members of the public, everybody involved in this. Uh, this is a thing that the BBC are going to film and uh, they're, they're very interested in doing it. And we're trying to get either the Halle or um, the Philharmonic or some other orchestra or people from a, an orchestra to actually play alongside the robots as well. And this is a real thing. It will be built. Um, so by uh, June next year, um, it will be in the city of Manchester around different venues, hopefully on the street. Um, and and the way it's going to work is that if everybody gets together and build it. So, so it's a bit of a call to action for people who, who um, are in hacker spaces or maker spaces, or if you just fancy getting your old Hoover out and trying to repurpose that as well. So um, if you do want to get involved, just please do contact me. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Or if, there's, if you've got kids and you think their school could get involved, 
whatever, whoever it is, then please just do get in touch with me for it. Um, so I started it by saying radio engineering could. Um, hopefully, I've shown you that radio engineering does. We really are uh, looking at solving the world's problems um, and uh, these 14 engineering grand challenges, trying to solve some of these 14 engineering grand challenges with radio frequency engineering. So thank you very much.